Oh my god. Okay, so first of all, there's a lot of you. I'm a little freaked out. Um, secondly, I had this like really cute little cardigan, and I'm really hot, so I took it off, and then I realized that this outfit is just really see-through. Um, <laughs> so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sit here because you can't see anything. It's fine. It's fine. Um, <laughs> And um, I'm, a, I'm a little, I have to say, I'm a little overwhelmed right now because um, I just heard an hour ago that uh, Fresh Week Out and the book uh, just hit number three on the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> um, and it's number two on the ebook list. Um, it was it was actually only beaten by Bill O'Reilly, who he just fucks up everything for everyone. Um, right? I was like, I saw it, and I was like, that asshole. Um, right? But he can't do anything right. Um, plus, the name of his book is Killing Reagan. Not nice, Bill O'Reilly. I didn't like you before, but even more now. Um, so uh, I wanted to start first with a. A tremendous thank you. Um, thank you so much, not only for being here, because um, it's drizzly, and I, I had to walk through the rain, so he probably did too. Um, but more importantly, thank you for supporting this weird little book, um, which I poured my heart into for years. Uh, and honestly, even a until six months ago, did not think that I would ever be able to finish. Um, I was able to finish it because so many people had my back. Um, and whenever I would get on Twitter or Facebook or on a blog and say, I'm a failure, I'll never finish this, I will never, I'll never have a second book, I can't do this, um, there were people there saying, you can do it, it's all right, we, we'll wait, we, we need to, you need 10 years, you need 20 years, whatever, take your time. Um, and that is a, a tremendous, wonderful thing, and I'm so incredibly lucky, uh, even more so because so many people now are coming and saying that this is um, affecting their life with a loved one who suffers from mental illness, um, or it's helping their child talk to them about issues that they're having, or a parent talk to their child. Uh, and that would not be happening if it wasn't for the support that you guys have given the book so that it gets out there. So um, I just wanted to pass on all the thank yous that I get to you guys because literally none of that would happen without it all. So thank you. Um, I am going to read two chapters. I keep trying to put my glasses on, but they keep bogging over because I'm so hot. <laughs> <laughs> and not like sexy hot. Just. <laughs> Like, if you had ice and you threw it on me, I'd say, bless you. Um, <sighs> my publicist, she was like, oh, this is an easy walk. And then I forgot that she's from New York. Um, and in, in Texas, we don't have easy walks. Like, even if you're walking up the stairs, it's like, oh, is there not an elevator? <laughs> Jesus, what? Um, and like, she didn't even pause. She's like got a, like her jacket on, and she's like, this is great, this is gonna be fine. And I'm like, yeah, why is this hill uphill? <laughs> Where are the downhill hills? Is everything uphill hill? I don't like this. Um, but then I got here, and somebody had their dog backstage, and their dog's name is Mary Todd Lincoln. It was the sweetest dog. <laughs> it started licking my face, and I was like, oh. Which was lovely because when I heard the news about it being on the New York Times list, which I was absolutely shocked because this is a really tough book season. I didn't think it would be on the list. I um, I laughed and then I cried and I threw up and then I brushed my teeth um, <laughs> and then I cried again and like it's exactly what I needed was to have a dog go like it's okay, we don't care, whatever. I'm a dog. Um, <laughs> So, uh, I'm going to read two chapters, one uh, super short and funny, one a little bit longer. Um, also, I think that there's some sort of an overflow room and that there are young professionals there, so I'm going to apologize in advance, young professionals, because I'm going to say fuck a lot. <laughs> um, 
And I will say that that is one of the advantages of being an old professional. Oh, old professional. That sounds like I'm a hooker. Um, right? I don't know what I say. An experience. Oh, that's just as bad. Um, just, it's one of the advantages of being me. I just get to say fuck a lot. Um, so you're, you're going to hear it. Ah, uh, let's see. So, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Furiously happy, dangerously sad. You're not crazy. Stop calling yourself crazy, my mom says for the 11 billionth time. You're just, you're sensitive and a little odd. <laughs> and fucked up enough to require an ass load of meds, I add. That's not crazy, my mom says as she turns back to scrubbing the dishes. You're not crazy, and you need to stop saying that you are. It makes you sound like a lunatic. <laughs> I laugh because this is a familiar argument. This is the same one that we have had a million times before and the same one that we will have a million times again, so I let it lie. And besides, she's technically right. I am not technically crazy, but crazy is a much simpler way of labeling what I really am. According to the many shrinks that I've seen in the last two decades, I am a high-functioning depressive with severe anxiety disorder, moderate clinical depression, and mild self-harm issues that stem from an impulse control disorder. I have avoidant personality disorder, which is like social anxiety disorder on speed, and occasional depersonalization disorder, which makes me feel utterly detached from reality, but in less of a this LSD is awesome kind of way, and more of a, I wonder what my face is doing right now, and <laughs> it sure would be nice to feel emotions again, sort of way. I have rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune issues, and sprinkled in like paprika over a mentally unbalanced deviled egg are things like mild OCD and trichotillomania, the urge to pull one's hair out, which is always nice to end on because whenever people hear the word mania, they always back off and give you more room on crowded airplanes. <laughs> probably because you're not supposed to talk about having a mania on a crowded airplane. This is one of the reasons why my husband Victor hates to fly with me. The other reason is that I often fly with taxidermied creatures as anxiety service animals. <laughs> Basically, we don't travel a lot together because he doesn't understand awesomeness. <laughs> you're not a maniac, my mom says in an aggravated voice. You just, you like to pull your hair. You even did it when you were little. It's just, it's soothing to you. It's like, it's like petting a kitten. <laughs> I like to pull my hair out, I clarify. It's sort of different. That's why they call it a mania and not kitten petting disorder. <sighs> Which honestly would suck to have because then you'd end up with a bunch of semi-bald kittens who would hate you. <laughs> my god, I hope I never get overly enthusiastic kitten pull furring disorder. And my mother sighs deeply, but this is exactly why I love having these conversations with her, because she gives me perspective. It's also why she hates having these conversations with me, because I give her details. <laughs> you are perfectly normal, my mom says, shaking her head, as if even her body won't let her get away with this sort of lie. I laugh as I tug involuntarily at my hair. I have never been normal, and I think we both know that. <laughs> My mom pauses for a moment, trying to think up another line of defense, but it's pretty hopeless. I have always been naturally anxious to ridiculous degrees. My earliest school memory is of a field trip to a hospital when a doctor pulled out some blood samples and I immediately passed out right into a wall of thankfully empty bedpans. <laughs> According to the other kids present, a teacher said, ignore her, she just wants attention. True story. <laughs> then my head started bleeding. And the doctor opened, cracked open an ammonia capsule under my nose, which is a lot like being punched in the face by an invisible fist of stink. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't know why I had passed out. My baseline of anxiety remained the same, but my subconscious was apparently so terrified that it decided the safest place for me to be would to be fast asleep on the floor, surrounded by bedpans, <laughs> which sort of shows why my body is an idiot, because forced narcolepsy is pretty much the worst self-defense ever. <laughs> It's like the human version of playing possum, which is only helpful if bears are trying to eat you, if this is true. Because apparently, if you lie down in front of bears, they're all, what a badass, I attack her and she just takes a cat nap, I probably should not fuck with her. <laughs> 
This would be the start of a long and ridiculous period of my life which shrinks label white coat syndrome. My family referred to it as what the hell is wrong with Jenny syndrome, and I think my family was more accurate because their assessment seems more realistic because passing out when you see doctor's coats is just damn ridiculous and more than slightly embarrassing. Especially later when you have to say, sorry I passed out on you, apparently I'm afraid of coats. <laughs> to make things even worse, when I pass out, I tend to flail about on the floor, and apparently I moan gutturally, like a Frankenstein, according to my mother, who has witnessed this on several occasions. Other people might battle a subconscious fear of adversity or failure or being stoned to death, but my hidden phobia makes me faint at the sight of outerwear. I have passed out once at the optometrist, twice at the dentist office, and two horrifying times at the gynecologist's. <clears throat> The nice thing about passing out at the gynecologist, though, is that if you're already in the stirrups, you don't have very far to fall. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're like me and you flail about wildly while you're moaning and unconscious. It's pretty much the worst way to pass out with someone in your vagina. <laughs> it's like having a really unattractive orgasm you're not even awake for. I always remind my gynecologist that I might rather loudly pass out during a pap smear, and she usually grimly informs me that she didn't need me to remind her at all. <laughs> the really bad part about passing out at the gynecologist is that you occasionally regain consciousness with an unexpected speculum inside your vagina, which is essentially the third worst way to wake up. The second worst way to wake up, by the way, is at the gynecologist without a speculum inside of you because the gynecologist took it out when you passed out and now you have to start all over again, which is why I always tell my gynecologist that if I pass out, just get everything out of the way while I'm out, take that opportunity. The first worst way to wake up is to find bears eating you because your body thought the safest defense was to sleep in front of them. <laughs> that playing possum bullshit almost never works. Not that I know, because I would never pass out in front of bears, because that would be ridiculous. In fact, I have been known to run at bears to get good pictures of them. Instead, I pass out in front of coats, which, according to my brain, are the things you really need to be worried about. <laughs> One time, I loudly lost consciousness at my veterinarian's office when he called my name. Apparently, my subconscious freaked out when I saw blood on the vet's coat, and then I abruptly passed out right onto my cat. That is not a euphemism. <laughs> I woke up shirtless in the lobby with a bunch of strangers and dogs looking down at me. <laughs> Evidently, when I started moaning, the vet called an ambulance, and when the EMTs arrived, they claimed that they couldn't find my heartbeat, so they ripped open my shirt. <laughs> Personally, I think they just wanted a cheap thrill. <laughs> I think the dogs looking down at me agreed, as they seemed slightly embarrassed for me after watching the whole spectacle unfold. But you can't really blame dogs, because first of all, who could look away from a train wreck like that? And secondly, dogs have no concept of modesty. <laughs> Waking up shirtless with a bunch of concerned dogs staring at your bra because you're afraid of coats is about the seventh worst way to wake up. <laughs> I mutter aloud to my mother. Huh. My mom says, non-committally, raising a single eyebrow. Well, okay, maybe you're not normal, normal, she says grudgingly. But who wants to be normal? You're fine. You are perfectly fine. You are better than normal, even, because you are so aware of what's wrong with you that you can recognize it and sort of fix it. And I nod, because she has a point, although the rest of the world might disagree with our definition of fixing it. When I was little, I fixed it by hiding from the world in my empty toy box whenever my undiagnosed anxiety got too unbearable. In high school, I fixed it by isolating myself from other people. In college, I fixed it with eating disorders, controlling what I ate to compensate for the lack of control that I felt with my emotions. And now as an adult, I control it with medication and with shrink visits and with behavioral therapy. I control it by being painfully honest about just how crazy I am. I control it by allowing myself to hide in bathrooms and under tables during important events. And sometimes I control it by letting it control me because I have no other choice. Sometimes I'm unable to get out of bed for a week at a time. Anxiety attacks are still an uncomfortable and terrifying part of my life. But after my furiously happy epiphany, I learned the importance of pushing through, knowing that one day soon, I would be happy again. 
This is why I sneak into other people's bathrooms in haunted hotels, why I once accepted a job as a political czar who reports directly to the stray cat who sleeps at City Hall. <laughs> I have staged live zombie apocalypse drills in crowded ballrooms. I've landed on aircraft carriers at sea. I once crowdfunded enough money to buy a taxidermy Pegasus. I am furiously happy. It's not a cure for mental illness. It's a weapon designed to counter it. It's a way to take back some of the joy that's robbed from you when you're crazy. Ah, oh, you're not crazy, my mom says again, waving a wet plate at me. Stop saying you're crazy. People will think you're a lunatic. <laughs> and it's true. They will. I Google the word lunatic on my phone and read her one of the definitions. Lunatic, noun. Wildly or giddily foolish. My mom pauses and stares at me and finally sighs in resignation, recognizing way too much of me in that definition. Hmm, she says, shrugging thoughtfully as she turns back to the sink. So maybe crazy isn't so bad after all. I agree. Sometimes crazy is just right. <sighs> I look like I've poured water. Just say I did. If you take any pictures, be like, she, yeah, she literally, she took a shower. She came right out. So he, she was like, what? T-shirt contest, what? <laughs> I, I will pre-warn you, if you ever take beta blockers, this will happen to you. You will lose everything you have ever drunk in your life on stage. Drip the drip. OK, so second chapter, much faster. I found a kindred soul, and he has a very healthy coat. A few weeks ago, I was at the pharmacy picking up my meds, and I was staring into the drive through window and thinking about how awesome it is that we live in a world where we can pick up drugs in a drive through window. <laughs> and that's when I noticed something strange next to the pharmacist register. And you probably can't see this picture, but this is an open box of milk bone dog biscuits. And I thought, well, that's odd, but maybe someone returned them because they were stale or something. And then I thought that was even odder that someone would recognize that dog biscuits had gone stale. <laughs> because dogs usually aren't very good at not eating cookies, even if they're fairly shitty. I mean, dogs eat used diapers if you let them, so I'm pretty sure none of them are saying no to cookies. But then the pharmacist came back, and while he was ringing me up, he reached over and picked up a handful of broken dog biscuits and ate them. <laughs> And I thought, wait, am I high right now? Is he high? Am I being tested? Should I say something? But I didn't, because I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to accuse the man giving you drugs of eating dog food. And then I signed for the drugs, and I drove away, and I thought to myself, is it possible that he accidentally ate the dog biscuits? Or maybe someone else is always stealing his food at work, so he decided to put his tasty human cookies made for humans and not from humans, in a milk bone box to keep them safe. Or maybe he just likes to entertain himself by seeing if people will tell him that he's eating dog food. Those would be good people, probably. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> but then I spent all day thinking, why the dog biscuits? And so I went back today to ask what the dog biscuits were gone, and the dog biscuit eating guy was also gone. And I thought, can I? this pharmacist, if the other pharmacist who eats dog food is around because I really need to know the story? And the answer is no. No, I can't. But I really want to know because I suspect that I would be great friends with this guy because anyone who would hide crackers in a dog food box seems like someone that I would like to hang out with. Although someone who just eats dog food for fun seems slightly more questionable. Except now I'm wondering if maybe milk bones are really delicious and he's just a genius who has discovered really cheap cookies. Cookies you don't have to call your judgmental vet about when your dog gets into the pantry and eats all of them. You still have to call the vet, though, when your cat has eaten a toy consisting of a tinkle bell and a feather and a poof ball all tied together with twine. That actually happened to me once, and it was the worst thing ever because the vet told me that I would have to ply the cat with laxatives to make the toy pass through easily, and I'd need to inspect the poop in order to make sure that the toy had passed because otherwise they would have to do open cat surgery. <laughs> And then it finally did start to pass, um, but just the first part with the tinkle bell. <laughs> and the cat was freaked out because he was running away from the tinkle bell, which was hanging out of his butthole. 
And when I called the vet, he said to definitely not pull on the twine because it would pull out his intestines, which would be the grossest pinata ever. And so I just ran after the cat with some scissors to cut off the tinkle bell, which impressively was still tinkling after seeing things no tinkle bell should ever have to see. And I think probably the cat was running away both because of the tinkle bell and because I was chasing it with scissors screaming, let me help you. If I was good friends with that dog food eating pharmacist, I would have called him to tell him all about the Tinkle Bell issue because I think he probably would have appreciated it. But I never found him again because I was worried that if I ever asked to see the dog food eating pharmacist, the other pharmacist would stop giving me drugs. <laughs> this does feel a bit discriminatory, but I can't explain exactly why. <laughs> Oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm going to pass out with relief, but none of you are wearing coats, so I'm good. <laughs> oh my gosh, yay. So the scariest part of the night is over. <laughs> now we can move on to the second scariest, which is Q&A. So how should we do this? Oh, yay. OK, I was about to say, I can't see anybody. Oh, well, the lights are up, though. I need to take a picture, y'all. So get, get, get prompt, get ready. Let's see. See, prepare to hide if you need to. Did you thank you? Yes, of course. Yes. Oh my gosh, bless you. Oh, this so comes in handy. <gasps> Who thought these up? They're a genius. Oh, it was me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna take a panoramic. Let's see. Hey, there you are, there you are, there you are. Fantastic, there's somebody missing there. There we go, <laughs> wonderful, perfect. Okay, and people upstairs in Overflow or wherever you are, you're here in spirit. Um, <laughs> so let's do, ooh, Q&A. Any questions? Oh my gosh, this is so much better. Sorry. <laughs> oh look, I'm making wind. Ooh. What? Well, you know, there are two Rory's. Um, there's Rory 1 and Rory, Rory 2. The Rory that is on the uh, front of my book is <laughs> actually in my daughter's room um, because turns out both Rory 1 and Rory 2 um, perfectly fit with a, it's not American Girl, but what's like the cheap Target knockoff of American Girl? A next Generation? Everything Next Generation totally fits these raccoons. <laughs> Um, so they're like, they're wearing all their outfits, they're driving around in that Vespa, they've got, it's fantastic. Um, and, and actually we've been taking a lot of pictures because I'm like, this would be a great picture book. And no, it wouldn't. Um, <laughs> it's entertaining to me. It's like the raccoons are like, they knock the doll over and then they steal the Vespa and it's just, it's very violent and inappropriate. Um, but it makes me happy. So. <laughs> Good question. What if a bear wore a lab coat? Would you be pissed off? If a bear wore a lab coat, I think I would be so fascinated. Um, no, I don't think I would pass out. I think I would, well, actually, you know what I'd probably do is I would run toward it because I'd be like, that's so awesome, Clint, and then I'd just pass out. Um, <laughs> because it's the same thing, like, I mean, I used to work at a hospital, and I would see, I, I would actually, they had that, you know, the theater where you could look down and you could watch. Surgery, I don't know if you can still do this. This was like 10 years ago. It's probably against the law now. But in the past, like if you've had something removed, I may have seen it if you did it in Houston. Um, and you looked lovely, just let me tell you. Uh, but, and I never, I never passed out, but it's only when I'm like face to face. So if the bear was close and wearing a lab coat, I might be a little fucked. Good question. Yes. Um, I, have, I have not adopted the president. I am still looking for a patriotic cat. Um, I will say, though, that if you go on Twitter and look up the president, I have reserved his account. Uh, I, have not, I have not really started it yet, uh, but it's, it's funny because um, I did it with uh, one of my new email accounts because I declare email bankruptcy constantly because I'm irresponsible. But this is my latest email account, which I always like sort of forget, but I go in every once in a while and Twitter's like, hey, the president, you know who you need to follow? Nathan Fillion. And I'm like, what? 
Leave the president alone. God. And also, Nathan Billion wouldn't hold twine. And I forgive him. It's okay. Yes. Thank you. Oh, that was, that was lovely. Um, you know, I, I really felt like I didn't have uh, a choice, to be honest with you. I mean, it would be really nice if I was like, oh, I'm so brave. Um, but I really, the, the issue is that when I was having these weeks of depression, uh, and I couldn't really function, I would just cling to the couch and just be like, just survive the week. That, just survive the week. If you survive the week, you've done well. And um, during that time, because I knew that it could pop up at any time, and I never knew when it was going to happen because my depression is you know, very chemical, and so there's no you know, complete trigger for it. And I would have these uh, blog posts that I had already written that were, you know, kind of funny, and I would just have this, like, trove where I could just, like, put it up and put it up, and I would have these comments, and they would be like, you're so funny, your life is so fun, oh my gosh, and I felt like such a fraud. Um, I felt like I was creating this false history, and, like, I was lying, um, and after probably about six months, I decided I don't really have a choice at this point. I really need to just come out and just say that I have depression and anxiety disorder and other issues. And I really thought, um, I thought people would, would leave. I thought they would be scared. Um, this was several years ago, and it's, it has gotten better. It's still not super easy. Uh, but I was, I was shocked at how many people, thousands of people came and said, Oh, me too. I thought I was the only one. I thought it was just me. What was really amazing about that is that in the time since I first started writing about that, I have had hundreds at this point of people who have come and who have said, I'm alive today. Um, I was actively planning my suicide, and I decided to get help, not necessarily because of anything that I wrote, but because they saw thousands of other people saying, me too, me too. And they realized that if I'm doing it and they're doing it and thousands of people are saying, oh my God, I thought I was the only one, I thought I was the only one who was worthless, that depression really is lying and that depression really can't be trusted. Um, and what I think is so amazing is so often uh, there will be you know, people in the in, especially in like the, the blogging community who will leave a comment and they're like, you know, I, I don't do anything, I feel worthless. And that comment may have been the one that made someone go and get help. And I'm so lucky that I get to see the people that pass by and say, my daughter told me that she was gonna commit suicide and she's alive today because of that community. And there are people in that community who think, oh, I, you know, I suffer in silence, but if you have ever spoken out, even anonymously, and said, you're not alone, or I feel it too, or even, I don't understand it, but I know somebody who has it, and I love them, and my life would be so sad without them, that you have touched people, and you've made a difference in their life. Um, and I'm so lucky that I get to see that, and I wish I could share that with every single one of you, because it's, it's such a privilege to be able to see. You feel my pain? <laughs> Um, that is that is a great question. For, oh yes, for those of you who who couldn't uh, couldn't hear it, um, trying to get a loved one to to admit that 
yes, you do have a problem, that yes, you are broken, that yes, you are crazy, whatever word it is that you use, um, that so often we sort of struggle against that because the people that we love don't want to use those words. And they want to say, like, it's going to be OK. You just need to smile. It's all right. It's not as bad as you think it is. And they really think that they're helping. And, and I completely see that, because I can see it even from my side, where I want to say the same thing of like, it's going to get better, it's going to get OK, because if you're not in a body feeling that and hearing those voices saying you're worthless, um, you don't know what it's, what it's like. Um, and, and the question was, did I ever get my mom to sort of admit that I was broken? And I guess the answer is yes and no. Um, yes, she, she absolutely will admit that there's something wrong with me. <laughs> um, uh, but she still continues to say, and, I, and I'm very grateful for her that she does, that she says, even though it's hard and the, even though I'm sorry if in any way I gave you this, which she didn't, um, that it makes you who you are and it makes you see things in a different way. Um, and it's, it is very true. And I think you see this a lot, like people with very high anxiety, they also have very high empathy. They're able to judge people in a very specific way to see past the, the mask and, and to kind of see like, oh, I see you. I know the pain that you're going through right now. Um, and people with depression quite often have the ability because they can go so low on the pain scale. They have the ability to truly appreciate those, those up times and those happy moments that kind of, kind of push you through. Um, my father, and I, I didn't write about this in the book because it wasn't really my story to tell and he wasn't open about it at the time, that my father um, suffers from a pretty severe mental illness as well and was not out about it. And in fact, I didn't know growing up. I was just like, something's wrong, but I don't know what it is. And so when I realized there was something wrong with me, I thought I was the only one. And it wasn't until um, I was in my 20s that somebody finally said, oh, you know that runs in the family, right? Like, you know that's, you're not alone. And, um, and, and I, wish I, had, I wish I had known. But I also understand that my father grew up in a different time and that there's a different stigma. Um, and not only that, but also it is harder for certain people. It is, I think it's harder for men than it is for women. It's harder for, I think, people of color than it is for non-color. I mean, I think there are, you know, harder stigmas in different types of communities, and especially for him as, like, an older military, you know, strong, masculine man that, that you know, you don't want to admit that there's something broken in you. Um, and uh, I, when I did my, my trailer for... Uh, furiously happy. I had people hold up the signs and it would say, you know, I'm broken because, but I'm furiously happy because. And um, my father uh, sent me a letter just a couple of days ago and he said, I'm broken because there's just something wrong with my head, but I'm furiously happy because um, I have two daughters who see things in a lovely and wonderful way. And one of them taught me to see myself in, in a way where I don't have to hide anymore. And, um, and that was really wonderful. And, and I think as people slowly start to talk about it, you, you start to realize not only one in four of us is going to deal with it at one time or another. If you haven't already, you probably will at one point deal with mental illness. It's possible, entirely possible. You already have it. You're just not diagnosed. Um, definitely at one point or another, you're going to have somebody that you love who deals with it. So being able to, to kind of read this and see like, OK, well, here's, here's what you should say. Here's what you shouldn't say um, can be helpful. And, and what I did try to do on this is to say, like, this is me. It's not necessarily you. Uh, and, I think, and I think a lot of times people would be like, oh, this is really helpful because now I know how to deal with my daughter or my son or my father. And I always want to say, like, but really ask them. <laughs> because this is what works for me. It is not what works for everyone. Although I will say, universally, just cheer up is just going to get you a glare. <laughs> just don't, don't do that. Just smile. Oh my gosh, like, your hair looks so nice. What's wrong? You look like... <laughs> Yes. So um, all my life I've hated taxidermy. Right? So I understand. Whatever my causes are at. But I can't go anywhere without seeing some sort of pathetic person go, oh, look at that silly. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. 
Um, I, I do get, people do send that. I, I love that you just apologized for possibly accidentally sending me dead animals in the future. <laughs> So most people don't get that, and that is fantastic. Um, I, I will say, uh, for those of you who are kind of new to this, if you haven't uh, finished reading the book or if you haven't read the first book, then you probably don't know my father's a taxidermist and has been all of his life, so I grew up with taxidermy, but I personally was against it. Um, I am actually a card-carrying member of PETA, literally a card-carrying, like when I send out my stuff, I have the like, little PETA address things, because they're like, yay, Jenny. I'm like, you don't know who I am, do you? Do you? <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but for me, like my dad does it as an art, and it's, and it's very beautiful. I don't get it, and I'm just, I'm like, oh, just get it, oh, it's so bloody gross. Um, but I am so in love with the idea of old, ridiculous, broken, to, which is what I love, like the, the old stuff that is 100 years old, and it's just hanging on a wall, and like a giant board, and it's missing its tooth, and you're just like, but look, it's smiling, and it's so happy, and it's got, I just want to put a hat on it, and then a stogie out of its mouth, and some little glasses, and that's exactly what I did. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I, I actually have, it's, it hasn't really spread to the rest of the house, it's just in my office, but I, I probably have 40 little taxidermy and animals, which is so ridiculous, but in my defense, Number one, almost all of them are mice. They're, so, they're teeny tiny and they died of natural causes or they were used to feed snakes and it's just, you know, whatever. Um, so I don't, I don't feel as bad. I'm like, whatever, it's the circle of life. Um, so, so there's that. And the, the other thing that I always go back to whenever people, um, because I do occasionally get people who are like, oh, you with the taxidermy, don't you know that's terrible? And I always bring up the fact that, um, James Garfield, uh, if you've been reading my blog long enough, I have this, he was the one that started my, my taxidermy collection, which is this horrible, ridiculous, terrible looking wild boar, just like he's missing an ear, he's missing a tusk, he's just horrible. Um, and I convinced my husband to buy him, even, I mean, like, for days of me going, like, Lee, and he's like, I'm not spending $90 on the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. And I was like, I'll make Christmas cards out of them, I'll sell them for $10 each, I only have to sell nine of them, and then I've made back the money. And he's like, oh, whatever, fine. So he comes out, and he, you know, he's got James Garfield, and I made the cards, and I ended up selling a ton of them, and ended up, like, you know, donating it to people in need during Christmas, and then that kind of inspired another, like, James Garfield Christmas miracle, where we said, we just basically, it's so ridiculous, it's, it is, it's the James Garfield Christmas miracle, I think we've done it, like, four years in a row, but, but basically where I was like, oh, I really want to help um, people who are struggling this Christmas um, with getting toys for their kids, because I, I totally get that I drew. I grew up really poor, and I know what it's like to, to struggle with that, so, like, the first you know, 30 people who say that they need help getting their kids toys, I'll send you an Amazon gift card that I made out of, you know, selling James Garfield stuff throughout the year. And, um, and it, the first 30 went uh, very quickly, and then the 31st and 32nd, 33rd, you know, popped up, and I went to my husband's office, and I was like, hey, I'm going to spend some more money. Is that okay? Like, cause there's, like, there's some more that are coming in, and he was like, yeah, that's, that's fine. We'll find a way to, you know, to make it work. By the time I had come back to my computer, there were other people saying, can I take care of the 31st person? And somebody else saying, can I sponsor the 32nd person? Um, and so what happened was completely uh, without any planning whatsoever, all of these people just decided like, okay, well set me up with this person, well set me up with this person. Um, and what was so fabulous was not only the fact that thousands of, of people were helped, but that so many people, like maybe one person would have four kids, and so I'd be like, okay, well, I'm gonna set you up with two donors, and that person would come back and say, you know what, they gave me so much that I have too much, can I take the Amazon stuff that they've donated, can I help another person? And they would pay that forward, and then the next year I was like, you guys, that was exhausting, I can't do it again. But we did do it again, and the reason that we did is because the people who said, please, please, let's do it again, they were all the people who had been helped. And they were like, please let me pass this forward. Um, and so we did it again. And I think we've done it, um, this, if we do it again this year, which maybe we will, kind of depends on how I'm feeling after tour. Um, James Garfield, the incredibly ugly taxidermied 
Boar's Head has raised a quarter of a million dollars that has been given with no sponsors, nothing. <laughs> it, is, it is really, it's amazing and wonderful. There's even like a Facebook page out there that's like the James, St. James Garfield where people like go out and say, hey, I want to help with somebody's or something. And I'm not even part of it. I just see it and I'm like, well, you guys are awesome. You know, they just go out on their own and it's, Fantastic and amazing and such great proof that that good people exist and that community is out there and that there is such hope and such wonderful just wonderful things out there. Even when our brains tell us that there aren't, that there really are. Sorry, I got off on a tangent because of James Garfield. Oh, I got distracted. Actually it was really funny too the first year when it happened. It got like a lot of um, a lot of press and people were like, oh, look, this is so awesome for your, for your traffic. And I was like, I don't do ads on my blogs. I don't care about traffic. And I don't, like, nothing happens. But uh, somebody in Canada picked it up. And so it was on ca like Canadian TV. And they were like, OK, let's, we want to set it up on a, on a satellite so we can do a, a picture and like, talk about it. And so I bring James Garfield into, this, <laughs> into the, the, the newsroom. And I'm holding this giant board, like thinking that the guy from Canada, which I can't see, I'm just like looking at a camera and I'm like, I've never been a camera before. I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but whatever, this is going to be funny to write about. And I'm holding James Garfield and, and I keep waiting for him to say something about it. He never does. <laughs> So it's just, and there's all these like these these YouTube like comments under this Canadian thing where they were just like, so do people in Texas just carry their like taxidermy around with them? <laughs> I guess so. Sorry, Canada, I've thrown you off. Any other questions? Oh yes, in the back. Uh, have you always been a writer? Um, yes, um, sort of unintentionally. Uh, because I had um, really severe anxiety disorder when I was a kid, I was afraid to talk. And so the way that I communicated was um, I would read, and this, the people that I would read were my friends, and uh, I would write, and that was my only way of real communication. Um, a lot of times people will ask me, like, what would you do if you weren't a writer? And my answer is a lot of drugs. <laughs> um, because, like, writing is my therapy, and I think writers write always. Um, I wrote in journals um, when blogging started. I blogged on a mommy blog, and then I did another mommy blog, and then I did the blog s, and then I was like, oh, let's do a book, and that's... And um, I have other books that will always stay in drawers because they're not really good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but I'm just like, I like to write poetry. This is not good poetry, but I'm driven to write it and nobody's going to read it, but I'm just going to, I'm going to keep writing it. And um, I, I, yeah, I've always been a writer and will always be a writer. I hope. <laughs> is there another question over here? Yes. When you started writing your blog, did you plan to write a book or was that something that just happened? Oh, that's a good question. So I, um, Oh, yes. Um, was I, when I started writing the blog, was I planning on writing the book or did it just sort of happen? I was not really planning on writing um, a book. Uh, I, I had written some of the stories down because I wanted to, I knew one day I'd want to share it with a child if I ever had it. Uh, so I had started to write down and also a lot of the medication I'm on affects my memory and I didn't want to lose some of those stories. So. Um, I was doing that, and I, uh, I was working in HR in a nonprofit religious organization in human resources, teaching people how to be appropriate. Is, <laughs> but it sounds like a punchline. I seriously did that for years. Um, and, and while I was doing it, I was reading this blog, and it was, uh, it was a parenting blog. And the woman had been doing it for a couple of months. It was on the Houston Chronicle, and she put up a post and she said, you know what, I don't think that you can be a good uh, parent and also a blogger. And I, um, and so I quit. And so I uh, sent a thing to the editor and said, well, apparently I'm a terrible parent because I'll do it, I'll do it for free. Uh, and it was a combination of I'll do it and for free that made him say, you're hired for no money. And so I, I started doing it and uh, continually got in trouble, constantly. 
um, weirdly enough, for saying irreverent and inappropriate things. And they were very nice about it because they couldn't fire me because I'm not getting you know, paid. But just like, OK, maybe don't say that. And we're getting some complaints about uh, And that's I, so I started to write the blogus, which I actually um, I had written this post because I was like, why aren't girls called bloggesses? Because it's like actor, actress, mister, mistress, blogger, bloggess. Why aren't we called? And everybody was like, eh, whatever. So I was like, fine, I'll be the bloggess. I'll be the only one. Um, and when I started the bloggess, I had two readers. And one was the girl in the cubicle next to me. And I would stand up and I'd be like, Christine, would you leave me a comment? <laughs> <laughs> And she'd be like, are you saying bad things about the Pope again? And I'd be like, not this time. And she's like, all right, fine. Um, and, but what happens is, is this amazing community of strange, wonderful people who had the same sense of humor that I had popped up. And, and when I would write things and think, oh, this is what's going to make people run away, um, they would say, oh my god, I always wondered why Jesus wasn't classified as a zombie because he came back from the dead. Me too. I, uh, this is... Yes, all of this, um, and and so the the community kind of kind of grew, and uh, and if you read my blog, you know I'm not being humble when I say this. That the comments are almost always way funnier than the post. It's almost like I throw out an idea, and then they're like, "Let's run with this and make this so much better." And I'm like, "Damn it! I should have said that." Oh, that's so good. I'm throwing water on the floor. Um, so. So, but I had, um, I had some stories that I had written, and I had an agent that contacted me after I did something horrifically mortifying uh, in public, and she was like, who was that, and what just happened? And people were like, well, it was the bloggers, and uh, who knows? Um, and she read my blog and was like, I think maybe you have a book here. And I was like, I do. It's in a drawer, and you, nobody can see it. And, uh, and she read it, and she was like, I think there's, I think there's a book here. And, like 10 years later, <laughs> there was. Uh, so if you are personally writing something and you're maybe five years into it, you're doing really well. Because seriously, first book, 10 years. This book took me almost four years. So I'm thinking third book, maybe two years. Maybe I'll get a little bit, a little bit better. And like, like Stephen King or Neil Gaiman who like get on a plane and then they take off and they land and they're like, I just published a new book. <laughs> How do you do it? <sighs> yes. When you were a kid, what were some of your favorite authors? Oh my gosh. When I was a kid, I loved uh, Lewis Carroll. Um, Ray Bradbury has always been like enormously big for me. I really liked Ruth Chu and people, <laughs> the, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I actually, I wrote, I wrote a post about like, oh, there's this author, Ruth Chu, and all of her stuff's out of print. I would have to go to like half price books and find the old ones and because I loved them and they were like treasures when I would find them. And, um, and what's really lovely is that uh, people are starting to find them again. And I got a, a thing from Ruth Chu's publisher and sadly she has died now, Ruth Chu. And uh, she was like, you know what? We, we've rediscovered her. We're, gonna, we're starting to republish. So people are like finding her books again, which I think is so lovely because... They're wonderful if you have kids. So good. Also, um, like all the Laura Ingalls stuff, although I have to say, you know what, if you read that again now, you'll be like, okay, Ma and Pa are kind of racist. You know? <laughs> like it's, a fu it's funny, you, you read and you're like, oh, these lovely childhood, and then you're like, I'm sorry, Pa's doing blackface, what? And I know you're like, hmm? No, he is, and there's pictures of it in the book. And you, you forget this stuff. You forget you're like, oh, Pa, you know? And then you're like, oh my God. And then Ma's like, I hate Indians. You're like, what? <laughs> oh my God. Uh, so, so, you know, some of those stories don't hold up as well. I was reading up to Haley and I was like, ooh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about how times change. <laughs> and so, yeah, good question. Yes. <laughs> knock, knock, motherfucker is the best. Yes. 
Yes, um, my Beyonce is uh, actually on the back porch, um, staring out into the backyard. Um, when, it, when we moved this last time, she lost a leg. And, uh, and, and I was very concerned, and so we had to have that like welded back on, and I was like, oh, what's gonna happen? Um, but she's fine. But what's really funny is, so I live in the Texas Hill Country, but I don't really say like where I live, but I just say, you know, Texas Hill Country. Well, there's somebody in the Texas Hill Country that has a Beyonce, but like it's even bigger than mine. It's like probably seven feet tall. And you can see it from like from the road. It's like right up in the front. And I always have people who are like, I know where your house is. We went and took pictures in front of your house today. <laughs> and I'm always like, I owe those people an apology. Whoever lives there, I am sorry. Because I'm sure they're like, what is happening here? Why do people keep coming out? But you know what? You put a giant cock in your front yard, that's gonna happen. <laughs> You're asking about, and my hands are clean. I mean, sort of clean, not really. <laughs> Any other questions before we, oh yes. I have only read your first book, but I have to say that when you wrote about your mother-in-law and how she had a sofa with cushions that one may not sit upon. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is such a good question. Um, the question is, how do I get along with my mother-in-law? Is this being taped? It is. Ah, oh, she's fantastic. I love her so much. Um, no, she's she's uh, she's she's very lovely, and I would say just like in the first book. We are still miles apart on pretty much everything you could imagine. Um, but the thing that brings us together is that once I had Haley, she was like, oh my gosh, this came out of your vagina. Oh, she didn't say that, <laughs> obviously. But she was like, ah, I made your grandchild. And I was like, I made that with my lady parts. Um, and then, and after that, there's not very much that, that you can say. And, and um, it is interesting because they are, my, my in-laws are very Republican, religious, staunch, just sort of kind of everything I'm not. Um, and I, I try not to like talk to them about anything that might be sort of triggering, but every once in a while they're like, boy, Trump's really doing good, right? And I'm like, Jesus Christ, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Why would you even say that? What is wrong with you? Uh, there, there, have been, there, have been a, there have been a few Thanksgivings that have been very tense where I've sort of had to walk out and then come back in and go, do we have any wine? Is there? Is there? Yeah. Is there some wine? Okay. All right. What is, what is really nice is Haley, um, she just turned 11, so she's finally like old enough that she kind of, she kind of like gets stuff. And um, she, the other day, we were all having a big family dinner and she was like, I'm so glad I'm a Democrat. And I was like, and, and you know, Victor's a Republican. Like, I'm, like, I'm the only, and so I was like, <laughs> you know, like, I know, I know I could change it any day, because that's, you know, the, but it was, and she, she was like, what do you guys think about Trump's immigration policy? I think it's pretty racist. And I was like, oh my God, I love you so much. Where'd you even get that from? And she was like, I don't know, I was watching the Republican debate, and I'm like, way smarter than me. I just watched it on Twitter. I was like, what's, what's Twitter say? I don't know. You tell me what to vote for. I don't care. Um, so it, it, it is a little nice. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely, some sort of arranged marriage. Uh huh. 
Oh my gosh, I love it. Um, her suggestion was with my mother-in-law, margaritas, which is actually a really great idea for anyone who is not my mother-in-law. Um, but actually, and, and I will say, and I, I'm gonna give her credit because I, I think she's really trying. Um, when I wrote this book, and I would say, like, this is what you don't say to people with depression, and, and you deal with people who really don't get it, it's pretty much my in-laws. Um, and I think they really are trying, but uh, the margaritas would not work because I'm not allowed to drink and I shouldn't be doing drugs and I should not be, I mean, like legal drugs, not, I mean, obviously I shouldn't be like snorting cocaine or whatever. But, <laughs> but um, I, it, it's, it's interesting whenever I see people and they're like, oh, you know, I'm kind of having to educate my family. I, I always sort of have to nod because um, that I'm exactly the same way with my in-laws, and it's, um, it's interesting, and uh, if they see this, they'll probably be upset, but uh, it's interesting how even, you know, I'm like, I, like, I wrote a book about it. Like, it's, you read it in your, in your newspaper. You read it was like, this is a really turning point, and you still don't get that this is not a choice that I have, and that this is not contagious, and that I'm not gonna give it to my child by being honest about you know what I have, and um, and to their credit, even though it's they're very, really slowly going, but they are, they are listening. And so, if you are struggling with somebody that you love who doesn't get it, trust me when I say every single person struggles with that. About whether it be mental illness or another disease, or I'm sure they think the same thing about being a Republican, you know, where they're like, why can't she understand that she's wrong? Um, so, so yeah, so it's just about being open-minded. Sorry, I just like bleh all over you guys about my, my in-laws, sorry. Was there one more question? Yes? Oh my gosh, that is such a good question. Um, my daughter wants us to all do like firefly costumes, not like the lightning bug, but like the, you know, starship and, you know. But I don't think anybody would get it. She's like, I want to be Kaylee. And, I, and I'm like, it's been so long. She just discovered it, so she, it's new to her. Ten years, Ten, exactly, 10 years, yes. Um, I kind of, I'm, I actually, somebody today was like, wouldn't it be awesome if there were a bunch of Rory costumes? And I was like, I think I could do this. <laughs> so, um, so it's possible I might be Rory. Um, I think last year we did Doctor Who, we all dressed up. As, and then I think the year before we did Walking Dead. So, oh, and Game of Thrones, we, do, we really just do TV. Oh, that's embarrassing, isn't it? <laughs> oh my God, I should, do, I should really do books instead, damn it. Although I will say, and I'm a giant proponent of this, if you guys haven't heard of it yet, um, Bill Gaiman came up with it, and it's, uh, oh my God, what is it called? All Hallows Read. All Hallows Read, exactly. Um, where basically, instead of giving out candy, you hand out books. And um, I, I bought like 50 Ruth Chu books, so that, and like, and kids are either gonna love me or they're gonna be like, fuck you, lady. <laughs> so. Whatever, I'm willing, I'm willing to take that a, a little bit. But it is a wonderful, wonderful thing um, to just like hand out books, and, and if, especially if you have kids that are in like the scholastic whatever, there's so many dollar books, like The Littlest Prince and the like, just where they're a buck, and you go and you're like, okay, I'll take 30 of those, and there we go, I've got the first 30. Highly recommend it, and whenever I've done it, the kids have, at least to my face, been like, oh, that's so exciting, I love it. <laughs> He is, um, he's the best. He's, he's so nice and just such a gentleman. And um, it's interesting. So I wrote, I wrote the chapter about, and if you haven't read it yet, um, basically he just sort of saved me when I was doing the audio book and I was terrified. Um, and you could hear it in my voice and I was so scared and I was afraid I was gonna mess up. And I know that you know he does it and so I, I uh, texted him and I was like, I'm totally gonna screw this up. They're about to throw me out, I can't do this. Um, what a, do you have any suggestions? And he just said, pretend you're good at it. And so I went back into the recording studio and I read a full page and the, the person was like, uh, that was great, Like I don't know what you just did, but keep doing it. And I was like, I just did a lot of cocaine. Um, <laughs> and, and then I was like, no, no, I just got some good advice. And. Uh, 
And, and I have always done, as a matter of fact, I pretend you're good at it. I have it written on my arm right now because I always have it on me. Um, he wrote a book that was part of a commencement. Uh, it was called, I think, Make Fabulous Mistakes. And he actually references it, but although he used a different, a, a different line, because I don't think he remembered exactly what it was. But when he talks about giving this advice to this girl, it was me. So it's interesting that we were writing the same book and writing about the same thing. And, and I have to say, today when I got the call that the book was on the New York Times list, um, I called my husband first, and then I called Victor, and then I sent uh, a text <laughs> to Neil Gay, and I was like, you're the best. You Like, seriously, I, like, you have helped me in so many ways, and thank you for inspiring me, and thank you for helping to inspire others. And then he sent me a picture of his baby, and I was like, ah! Um, so anyway, he's lovely. And if you have not ever read Neil Gaiman, go out and do yourself a favor because first of all, American Gods, fantastic. But like all the Sandman trilogy, like that was my catcher in the rye. Like everybody else is like, catcher in the rye. I'm like, whatever, spoiled kid. I hate that kid. Um, <laughs> I read Sandman and I was like, oh my God, somebody out there gets me. This, oh, oh, it's, it's out there. Somewhere I'm going to find my tribe. That was the, the like turning point book for me. Um, so it's it's so I'm I'm so privileged to be able to have him as kind of a mentor and sorry I talk about him too much but I love him he's fantastic he's <laughs> wonderful sorry all right so maybe we do one more question and then we do the reading let's see which one which one with okay keep clam I mean you have to come on. <laughs> That was actually, it was in Nashville at this theater, um, SCAD show or something. What was it? We were in Atlanta. Atlanta, oh yeah. Where am I now? <laughs> <laughs> I literally don't know what state I'm in. Um, yeah, so we were in Atlanta, uh, and um, yeah, that was the craziest thing. And it's, it doesn't have like horns, those are alligator gars coming out of its head. I saw that, I was like, can I please buy that? And they were like, no, one of our students did that. Um, but the entire, like, and I went into the bathroom and they had all these like black Jesus faces looking down at the toilet and I couldn't pee and I was like, stop looking at me, Jesus. You know, I'm like, what's good? How do people pee in here? Um, they had like, so, it, was, it was absolutely, I highly recommend it. It was the weirdest place I have ever spoken at and I loved it. It was lovely. So should we start the... Signing, because I know a lot of you have to hit the road. Yeah, signing? Yay!